Are you ready to learn about the story of an absolute legend? In the serene beauty of the Northwest's San Juan Islands, a teenage fugitive left authorities baffled as he made cars disappear, stole planes, and claimed vacation homes as his own. Meet Colton Harris Moore, the barefoot bandit, whose daring crimes, from car thefts to plane escapades, captivated the media and ignited a massive online following. And he did it all before the age of 20. But hey, let's not keep all this fascinating knowledge to ourselves. Join our community of curious minds by subscribing right away. When you do, drop us a comment saying I subscribe to let us know you're on board. We'll be thrilled to respond and engage with your questions and suggestions. Together, let's embark on an exciting journey to uncover hidden secrets and untold tales on Becker's casual history. Born in 1991, Colton Harris Moore faced a tumultuous upbringing on Kamano Island. His father's substance abuse led to family struggles, while his mother, Pamela Cola, battled alcoholism. Colton's delinquent behavior began early, with runaways and break-ins for survival as a child. By 12, he was in legal trouble, sent to facilities for young offenders. School was no haven either, and he stopped attending in ninth grade. After his capture in February 2007 and admission to several crimes, he spent time at Green Hill School and later Griffin Home Residential Treatment Center. However, he escaped in April 2008, returning to Kamano Island for more break-ins, capturing local and media attention. Now, let our story truly begin for this absolute legend. It's July 18th, 2008, and over on Kamano Island, sheriff's deputies spring into action, chasing down a black Mercedes. As the police cars close in, the Mercedes driver throws us a curveball, jumps out of the car and vanishes into the nearby woods. Officers search the abandoned vehicle and discover a treasure trove of stolen goods, including credit cards, cell phones, and even a digital camera. And here's the kicker. The driver's taken a series of self-portraits, including one of himself lounging like a forest philosopher, staring up at the lens. This intriguing image catches fire online, sparking a swelling fan base eager to follow the twists and turns of this unfolding crime saga. By now, our 17-year-old fugitive's got a catchy moniker, the Barefoot Bandit. Why? Because he's got a knack for crime without the comfort of shoes, leaving footprints as his calling card. As the legal pressure cranks up, Colton decides to crank up the audacity meter. He goes full Houdini and escapes from Kamano Island, swiping a boat to set sail for Orcas Island. When he lands in August 2008, the San Juan County Sheriff's Office suddenly finds itself swimming in a sea of burglary reports. The situation gets so hair-raising that on October 2, 2008, the Orcas Island Chamber of Commerce holds an emergency session to figure out how to deal with this sudden burst of high-tech heists. Meanwhile, the law enforcement cavalry is on the hunt, with Colton now firmly in their sights. Now brace yourselves, because November 12, 2008, is where it gets cinematic. Colton decides to outfox the Orcas Island police dragnet by commandeering a Cessna 182 a single-engine airplane straight from a hangar. The kicker, no aviation experience. Yet he pulls off a 300-mile flight to the east, a true underdog in the skies. The aircraft makes a bumpy landing on the Yakima Indian Reservation, and our protagonist slips away. Legend has it, he mastered flying by devouring aircraft manuals, binging instructional DVDs, and logging hours on Microsoft Flight Simulator, a game he's cherished since his early days. And, you guessed it, when the authorities poke around the plane, they find footprints etched into the cockpit, like a breadcrumb trail pointing right at Colton. Fast forward a year, and Colton's still giving authorities the slip. And so, he returns to Kamano Island in May 2009, rekindling his thrilling game of hide-and-seek with the Island County Sheriff's Department. Then, in the wee hours of June 19, 2009, our young outlaw decides to pull a daring heist, breaking into a patrol car parked right in front of a deputy's house. He walks away with some serious police gear swag, including a cell phone, an official police rifle, and a bundle of ammo. As you can imagine, this grabs the Sheriff's Department's attention and they launch an all-out manhunt for this law-evading prodigy. By this point, Colton, now 18, has refined his craft to an art form. Now, in the late summer and early fall of 2009, he boldly snatches his second plane, a Cirrus SR-22 right from the public airport on San Juan Island. He takes that flying beauty over to Orcas Island, elegantly landing on the runway. 
But hold on. He's not done. Our airborne maverick then nabs a boat and sails it to Point Roberts, carving a path of burglaries across the expanse of British Columbia before going to Bonner's Ferry, northern Idaho, for some ungodly reason. Then, on September 29, 2009, it's another jaw-dropping move. He storms into an airplane hangar in Bonner's Ferry and emerges victorious with a Cessna 182 under his belt. He doesn't just flaunt this new acquisition locally, he takes it on a 260-mile western flight. The plan? Touchdown on Kamano Island. But plot twist, he runs out of fuel, crash landing near Granite Falls. And guess what? Those ever-discerning investigators find a set of footprints at the Idaho hangar, a signature Harris Moore flourish. Now here's where it gets interesting. Kola, his own mother, is asked about the thefts and her son's involvement. And you might be surprised by her response. She stated, I'm proud of him. I was going to send him to flight school, but I guess I don't have to. Now that's some unconventional parenting for you. Clearly that's mother of the year material right there. Zoom in on October 2nd, 2009. A fresh felony warrant pops up, this time for forced entry burglary. Swiftly followed by a federal warrant two months later. All thanks to that Bonners Ferry airplane affair. Colton's now the prime suspect in about 100 thefts spread across the landscape of Washington, Idaho and Canada. But does that slow him down? Not a chance. On February 10th, 2010, he commandeers yet another Cirrus SR-22, this time from Anacortes Airport. He lands it gracefully on Orcas Island, only to embark on another adventure the very next day, a break-in at homegrown grocery. He snags over $1,000 and leaves behind a trail of chalky footprints, culminating with a charming message, See ya! The FBI and DHS converge on Orcas Island, and the Coast Guard sends its cutters to patrol the offshore waters, eyes peeled for anything fishy. But, you guessed it, Colton still pulls a vanishing act. He gives Orcas Island the slip, dashes over to San Juan Island, and from there, sails back to his home turf, Kamano Island. And just when you thought things couldn't get more intense, the FBI slaps a juicy $10,000 reward on the table, dangling it in front of anyone who can help them catch this 19-year-old escape artist. May 31st, 2010, brings an intriguing twist. A handwritten note accompanied by a $100 bill shows up at a veterinary clinic in Raymond. The note's message is as simple as it is striking. Drove by, had some extra cash. Please use this money for the care of animals. Colton Harris Moore, a.k.a. the Barefoot Bandit. Jumping ahead to June 2010, Harris Moore decides he's had enough of the heat in Washington and it's time for a change of scenery. So, he kicks off a wild journey, making his way through a series of stolen vehicles navigating the winding roads all the way to the eastern edges of Illinois. Just as the 4th of July fireworks light up the sky, news hits that a Cessna has vanished from an airport in Bloomington, Indiana. And guess who the immediate suspect is? None other than our audacious aviator, Harris Moore himself, and his ambitious destination, Cuba, a place where extradition treaties are just a myth. Using his flying prowess, he charts a course that lands him in the Bahamas, albeit with a rather bumpy landing near Great Abaco Island. From there, he seamlessly transitions into survival mode, blending into a fishing village as he cleverly sustains himself. Now, let's set the stage for July 11th, 2010, the day that marks the final act of Colton's high-flying escapade. He was captured at Harbor Island, just before dawn. Bahamian police, armed with tips from local residents, closed in on him after he ran a stolen boat onto a sandbar getting stuck just a short distance from the shore. The police shot out the boat's engine and ordered him to surrender. Harris Moore eventually gave himself up to the authorities. 48 hours later, and the wheels of justice were in full motion. Harris Moore is whisked away from Nassau, landing in the heart of Miami's legal stage. But the show's not over yet. Enter the federal district court in Seattle, where January 27, 2012, becomes a pivotal moment. A U.S. District Court judge extended a lifeline to Colton, offering him a fresh beginning with a six-year prison term serving concurrently. In the courtroom, he opened up, expressing genuine remorse for his actions and revealing his post-prison aspiration of becoming an aeronautical engineer. Shortly after entering prison, an unexpected development unfolded. Harris Moore sold the rights to his life story to 20th Century Fox for a remarkable sum of $1.4 million. Every penny of this deal was earmarked for restitution, 
following the conditions of his sentencing. After his release from prison on September 2, 2016, at the age of 25, he took up residence at a halfway house near Seattle as part of his probation terms. Believe it or not, he initiated a GoFundMe campaign, aiming to raise over $125,000 for flight school training. Expressing his aspirations on the fundraising page, he wrote, Now I am 25 years old, free, and ready to do it. Fly legally. I love airplanes, but I will never steal one or break the law again. I broke the law big league when I was younger, but now it's time to focus on my career and life in the free world. Despite having received $1.4 million from 20th Century Fox, which was directed towards restitution, Colton still had a debt of $129,000 to repay to his victims. Consequently, he was instructed to cease fundraising efforts until he had cleared this outstanding balance. On his now-deleted Twitter account, he shared his sense of disillusionment, stating, I feel like my dream has been crushed. What a terrible feeling. As of now, his current location remains unknown. The hope for his supporters echoes in the phrase, Fly, Colton, fly. Before we wrap up, have you ever been fascinated by time travel? Get ready to immerse yourself in the captivating story of Ukrainian time traveler Sergei Ponomarenko. Just a click away is your passport to an adventure that will transport you into a world that will make you question the very fabric of existence. Let's dive in. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your trusted host and purveyor of all things informative and absurd. Tonight, our main character is none other than Ramona Bass, a man whose extravagant lifestyle and vain pursuits led to his inevitable downfall. In this gripping tale, we'll delve into Abbas's background and trace the roots of his devious activities. But we won't stop there. We'll also take a detour into the fascinating history of the 419 fraud and the notorious Yahoo boys who made it an art form. Prepare yourselves for a riveting exploration of greed, cunning, and the perils of leading a flashy life online. But first, let's set the stage. Ramona Bass, or as he liked to call himself, Hush Puppy, was a man who reveled in the glitz and glamour of social media. His Instagram feed was a parade of private jets, fast cars, and enough bling to put Mr. T to shame. Little did he know that his ostentatious displays of wealth were leading him down a treacherous path, leaving a digital trail for the FBI to follow. Our mission today is to understand how someone could be so foolish as to engage in cybercrime and in Abbas's case, get caught in the act. Trust me, folks, this is a cautionary tale for anyone who thinks they can flaunt ill-gotten gains without consequences. Spoiler alert, it doesn't end well for our protagonist. So grab your popcorn, settle into your chairs, and prepare to witness the rise and fall of a cyber criminal extraordinaire. But hey, don't keep all that knowledge to yourself. Join our community of curious minds by subscribing right now. When you do, drop us a comment saying, I subscribe, to let us know you're on board. We'll do our best to respond and engage with your questions and suggestions. Together, let's uncover the hidden secrets and untold tales on casual history. Ramona Bass was born in the bustling city of Lagos, Nigeria. In a country marked by economic disparities and limited opportunities, Lagos became both the backdrop and the catalyst for our so-called protagonist's journey. Within its vibrant energy and economic struggles, Ramon experienced a blend of hardships and dreams that shaped his path. But this wasn't a simple tale of triumph against all odds. No, Ramon faced a myriad of obstacles that would make your head spin. From the scarcity of quality education to the stagnant economy and the pervasive presence of corruption, he grappled with the harsh realities of a society in flux. Yet these challenges didn't quell Ramon's aspirations. Instead, they fueled his determination to break free from the constraints of his circumstances. In this quest for a better life, he embarked on an unconventional path, one that led him into the alluring realm of cybercrime, the allure of wealth, power, and the chance to transcend the limitations imposed upon him became too enticing to resist. With a mind shaped by his early experiences and an insatiable hunger for a brighter future, Ramon set his sights on the world of cybercrime. In a landscape where opportunities seemed scarce, he saw it as his way to defy the odds and rewrite his own story. It wasn't just about outsmarting the system. It was his means of transcending the boundaries imposed upon him. Let's go back in time and unravel the captivating history of the 419 fraud and the notorious Yahoo boys. It all began with a simple idea, an idea that would go on to become one of the most infamous forms of fraud in the digital age. Ramona Bass, our flamboyant protagonist, found himself entangled in this web of deceit. 
Drawing inspiration from the rich history of the 419 fraud, Abbas embraced the art of manipulation and deception, setting his sights on amassing wealth through illegal means. With his charismatic persona and a keen eye for exploiting vulnerabilities, he maneuvered his way into the world of cybercrime. The annals of the 419 fraud are replete with infamous cases that left a lasting impact on both individuals and institutions. But let's not forget that while the Nigerian fraudsters were grabbing headlines, the reality is that they only encompassed a small portion of the cybercrime landscape. In fact, a staggering 71% for this cybercrime originated from the United States. But hey, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story, right? Now let's turn our attention to the emergence of the Yahoo Boys, a term used to describe the young Nigerians who ventured into cybercrime activities, often utilizing email scams to defraud unsuspecting victims. They found a haven in the virtual world, employing sophisticated tactics to exploit the vulnerabilities of individuals and organizations alike. Within this vast network of cybercriminals, notable individuals and groups rose to prominence. From the self-proclaimed G-Boys, who flaunted their ill-gotten wealth on social media, to the cunning syndicates that specialized in identity theft and advanced fraud schemes, the Yahoo Boys community became a force to be reckoned with. Their methods were as diverse as they were devious. From phishing scams and romance fraud to business email compromise and identity theft, the Yahoo boys deployed an arsenal of tactics to deceive and swindle their targets. They mastered the art of manipulation, exploiting the human psyche and capitalizing on the insatiable desire for wealth and prosperity. Now let's fast forward to the year Abbas decided to pack his bags and embark on a new chapter in his life. It was in the vibrant and bustling country of Malaysia that he sought new opportunities and greener pastures. The exact year of his relocation remains a mystery, but one thing is clear. He had aspirations that extended far beyond the borders of Nigeria. In Malaysia, Abbas found himself drawn deeper into the world of cybercrime, specifically focusing on a notorious scam known as the Business Email Compromise, BEC. This nefarious scheme has become a favorite among cybercriminals worldwide, and Abbas was no exception. The mechanics of the BEC scam are as intricate as they are cunning. It starts with email spoofing, a technique that allows fraudsters to manipulate the sender's email address, making it appear as if the message is originating from a legitimate source. Armed with this deceptive disguise, Abbas and his cohorts would target individuals within organizations, often those responsible for financial transactions. With careful precision, they would deploy social engineering tactics to trick their victims into divulging sensitive information or unwittingly authorizing fraudulent wire transfers. The victims, deceived by the seemingly authentic nature of the emails and the trust they placed in the sender, would unknowingly facilitate the flow of funds into the hands of the cyber criminals. Abbas spared no expense when it came to selecting his victims. From multinational corporations to unsuspecting individuals, he cast his net wide, leaving a trail of financial devastation in his wake. One notable case involved a paralegal at a New York law firm who unknowingly wired $923,000 into an account linked to Abbas. The funds, intended for a real estate refinancing, disappeared into the depths of his illicit empire. These targeted individuals and organizations suffered substantial financial losses, which served as a stark reminder of the destructive power wielded by cyber criminals like Abbas. So let's peel back the curtain and shine a light on one of the juiciest aspects of Abbas's criminal empire, money laundering. It's like the magical cloak that allows individuals like him to transform their dirty money into sparkling, seemingly legit funds. Money laundering is a fancy term for the process of turning ill-gotten gains from illegal activities into what appears to be squeaky clean moolah. It's like taking a hot pile of cash and giving it a spa day, complete with facials, massages and a fresh coat of legitimacy. The goal? To make it incredibly tough for law enforcement agencies to trace and seize those naughty, naughty funds. Abbas, being the crafty fellow he is, employed a whole bag of tricks to launder his ill-gotten riches. One of his go-to methods was the use of shell companies, those mysterious entities created solely to cover up the tracks of money movements. These companies posed as legitimate businesses, giving Abbas's shady activities a fancy, respectable facade. But wait, there's more. Cryptocurrency transactions also played a starring role in Abbas's money laundering escapades. With the rise of decentralized digital currencies like Bitcoin, 
he found a way to whisk his dirty money across borders without raising any red flags. And what's a good money laundering scheme without a touch of offshore flavor? Abbas knew that stashing his ill-gotten gains in secret offshore accounts was the way to go. These hidden treasure troves, nestled in countries with loose regulations and strict secrecy laws, acted as safe havens for his dirty dough. Now let's talk numbers, shall we? The amounts involved in Abbas's money laundering extravaganza were mind-boggling. Though we can't give you the exact figures, it's estimated that he laundered millions, if not billions, of dollars. That's right, folks. We're talking about an ocean of cash flowing through a labyrinth of financial channels, swirling around the globe like a whirlpool of illicit transactions. And where were the headquarters of this money laundering operation? You guessed it. Places known for their lenient financial regulations and anonymity. Think United Arab Emirates, where Abbas decided to set up camp for a while. And let's not forget those other offshore jurisdictions, those little havens of secrecy that aided him in the art of moving and hiding his ill-gotten loot. Now, who were the unfortunate victims of Abbas's cunning cybercrime schemes? Among the notable victims were individuals, businesses, and even financial institutions that found themselves in the crosshairs of his calculated fraud. From unsuspecting individuals who fell for his carefully crafted scams to established companies blindsided by his elaborate schemes, the list of victims is a chilling reminder of the havoc he wreaked. Specific cases of large-scale fraud orchestrated by Abbas and his organization dot the timeline of his criminal reign. Let's not forget his audacious attempts to snatch a whopping $124 million from an English Premier League soccer club. While the details of this brazen escapade remain somewhat shrouded in mystery, it serves as a chilling reminder of the sheer audacity of his criminal ambitions. But let's take a detour here and shine a light on an unexpected twist in this cybercrime saga. Enter the North Korean hackers. Yes, you heard that right. These digital warriors from the secretive nation reportedly joined forces with Abbas, adding another layer of intrigue to his already intricate web of deception. Together, they conspired to unleash their cyber prowess on unsuspecting victims, further amplifying the scale and impact of his criminal activities. Now, let's not forget the supporting cast of this cybercrime saga. Behind every successful criminal mastermind, there are often a few willing accomplices or facilitators. While the full extent of the organizational involvement remains a subject of investigation, it is believed that Abbas had a network of individuals working alongside him, aiding and abetting his fraudulent activities. These shadowy figures, whether motivated by personal gain or simply entangled in his web, played their part in perpetuating the web of deception. So spare a thought for the victims of Abbas's calculated fraud, those whose lives were upended and wallets emptied. They became pawns in a game they never signed up for, left to pick up the pieces of shattered trust and shattered finances. Let's explore a textbook example of how one's downfall can be fueled by vanity, a cautionary tale of arrogance leading to a spectacular unravelling. It seems like our dear friend Ramona Bass, also known as Hush Puppy, had quite the birthday surprise. And by surprise, I mean handcuffs and a one-way ticket to the slammer. Happy birthday indeed. Now, what led to this grand downfall, you might ask? Well, let's talk about the vanity, the audacity, and the irresistible urge to flaunt his ill-gotten gains on social media. Mr. Hush Puppy sure knew how to put on a show. Private jets, fast cars, and enough designer clothing to clothe a small village. He was like a one-man circus, parading his ostentatious lifestyle for the whole world to see. But little did he know that his online antics were not just catching the envy of his followers, they were also catching the attention of law enforcement agencies. While some might argue that it was his genius plan to maintain his social media presence as a social media personality, we all know the truth. It was his vanity that ultimately led to his undoing. You see, his extravagant posts showcasing his luxurious life caught the eye of those who were less impressed by his Gucci bags and shiny cars. They saw through the facade and realized that something fishy was going on behind the scenes. And so an investigation was launched, the gears of justice began to turn, and Mr. Hush Puppy found himself in the crosshairs of the law. But let's talk evidence, shall we? The digital footprints left behind by our dear friend were like breadcrumbs leading straight to his downfall. His social media accounts were a treasure trove of incriminating evidence. From the flashy photos in front of private jets to the lavish shopping sprees, everything was meticulously documented. It's almost as if he wanted to shout, look at me, I'm a cyber criminal. And oh, how law enforcement agencies love to look. 
They found phone and email records containing a multitude of fraud files, enough to make your head spin. Over two million addresses were potentially linked to his schemes, and the companies he targeted spanned continents. It was a worldwide crime spree, and Mr. Hushpuppy's social media posts were the breadcrumbs that led them straight to his door. So, my friends, let this be a lesson to all the wannabe cyber criminals out there. Vanity and social media don't mix well. If you're going to engage in illicit activities, maybe don't flaunt your ill-gotten gains for the world to see. Because the internet never forgets, and the authorities are always watching. And when they come knocking on your door, you won't be able to post your way out of trouble. In conclusion, we have delved into the captivating story of Ramon Abbas, a man whose foolishness and attention-seeking behavior ultimately led to his downfall in the realm of cybercrime. Let Abbas's story serve as a cautionary tale, a stark reminder of the consequences that await those who choose the path of cybercrime. Engaging in illegal activities not only harms innocent victims, but also carries severe personal consequences. It highlights the crucial need for individuals to prioritize their online security, exercise caution, and remain vigilant in the face of ever-evolving cyber threats. But before we bid farewell, I have a special treat for you. Look up right there at the top of your screen. Join us in the next video as we dive into the captivating world of Li Fang Wei by exploring the path of international arms dealing and his impact on global security. Also, there's a $5 million bounty on his head, so you might want to get the phone number to grab that bag. Enjoy. Good evening and welcome. Tonight, we have a tale that will leave you both amazed and slightly terrified. It's a story that combines the world of espionage with the absurdity of real life events. I'll be your guide through this captivating journey into the realm of this real life Bond villain. Now, we all know that Bond villains are larger than life. They possess an air of mystery, an insatiable thirst for power, and a knack for evading capture. And today, we introduce you to a man who seems to embody all those qualities and more. His name is Li Fang Wei, but you can call him the chameleon. Li Fang Wei is not your typical villain. He's not stroking a cat or living in an underground lair. No, this man operates in the real world, walking a fine line between legal and illegal activities. His story reads like a script from a Bond film filled with clandestine deals, international intrigue, and a cat and mouse game with the world's most powerful nations. Li Fang Wei, or Carl Li, as he's known in some circles, has been accused of being a key player in Iran's missile program. The United States government has described him as a principal contributor to Iran's pursuit of ballistic missiles. But what makes him truly fascinating is his ability to evade capture and continue his operations right under the noses of authorities. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does he do it? Well, my friends, Li Fang Wei possesses the chameleonic qualities of a true Bond villain. Despite being the subject of sanctions, having a bounty on his head, and being indicted by the US Department of Justice, this man has managed to adapt, evade, and continue supplying sensitive ballistic missile parts to Iran. It's like he's playing a game of hide and seek with international law enforcement agencies. But here's the thing, and this is what separates Li Fang Wei from the fictional villains we love to hate. He doesn't fit the stereotypical image of a Bond villain. He's not a maniacal mastermind with a grandiose plan for world domination. Instead, he operates in the shadows using his business acumen and legal gray areas to his advantage. His weapons of choice, dual use goods, products that can be used innocently in everyday life but have the potential to aid military endeavors. Lee specializes in trading these dual-use goods, which include items like graphite, fiber-optic gyroscopes, and other high-tech components used in aerospace and missile guidance systems. And the brilliance of his business model is that these products don't scream illegal like a stolen nuclear warhead might. They can be easily explained away as intended for industrial purposes, creating a veil of plausible deniability. So, my friends, let us delve into the world of Li Fang Wei, the enigmatic chameleon of international proliferation. As we peel back the layers of his operations, you'll see how he manages to stay one step ahead of the law, juggling aliases, front companies, and connections that would make even the suavest of Bond villains envious. But hey, don't keep all that knowledge to yourself. Join our community of curious minds by subscribing right now. When you do, drop us a comment saying, I subscribe, to let us know you're on board. We'll do our best to respond and engage with your questions and suggestions. Together, let's uncover the hidden secrets and untold tales on casual history. Li Fang Wei, the man of mystery. It's as if he stepped right out of a spy novel, complete with a murky past and an air of intrigue. Born in Heilongjiang, China, on September 18th, 1972, Li Fang Wei's early life is a riddle waiting to be solved. Little is known about his upbringing, his family, or the circumstances that shaped him into the enigmatic figure he is today. 
And that, my friends, only adds to the allure of our Bond villain in the making. Now, I have to admit, this level of secrecy is impressive. The man knows how to keep his cards close to his chest. But don't worry, we won't let his mysterious origins stop us from peeling back the layers and revealing the truth behind this captivating character. While we may not have all the details of his early life, one thing is clear. Li Feng Wei is no ordinary individual. He possesses an innate talent for navigating the treacherous waters of international trade and proliferation. It's as if he was destined for this role, honing his skills in the shadows until he emerged as a formidable force in the world of illicit activities. But remember, my friends, a Bond villain is not born overnight. It takes years of experience, cunning, and a touch of audacity to become a worthy adversary. And Li Fang Wei, with his unknown past and mysterious origins, fits the bill perfectly. Now, the art of dual identities, Li Fang Wei certainly knows how to keep us guessing. Just when you think you've got a handle on him, he slips into a different persona like a master of disguise. One moment he's Li Fang Wei, the next he's Carl Lee, blending seamlessly into the shadows. Now, let's pause for a moment and appreciate the brilliance behind this duality. It takes a special kind of person to effortlessly switch between identities, always staying one step ahead of the game. Li Fang Wei's ability to assume different aliases adds a layer of intrigue and complexity to his character, making him a true Bond villain in every sense. But why the need for multiple identities, you might ask? Well, my friends, it's all about survival and evading capture. By operating under different names, Li can manipulate front companies and deceive those who dare to stand in his way. It's a game of cat and mouse, with Li donning different masks to keep his true intentions hidden from prying eyes. Just imagine the possibilities. One moment, he's Li Fang Wei, the seemingly innocent businessman. The next, he's Carl Lee, the mastermind orchestrating elaborate schemes behind the scenes. It's the stuff of espionage thrillers, and Li Fang Wei has perfected the art of playing both sides of the coin. As the diabolical endeavors of Li Fang Wei continue to unfold, this Bond villain doesn't just dabble in the arms trade, he plays a significant part in fueling the world's most dangerous conflicts. Li's involvement in Iran's ballistic missile program is a stark testament to his villainous ambitions. He is not merely a middleman, he is a principal contributor, a driving force behind Iran's pursuit of devastating missile technology. Through a network of front companies and deceptive tactics, Li procures dual-use goods, blurring the line between legitimate trade and illicit proliferation. One striking example of Li's sinister dealings is his connection to Limt Economic and Trade Company Limited, designated under Executive Order 13382 in June 2006. Limt was exposed as providing material support to Iran's ballistic missile program. And who was at the helm of this treacherous operation? None other than Li Fangwei himself, using the alias Carl Li. Li's ability to operate through front companies like Limt demonstrates his mastery of deception and his insidious commitment to advancing Iran's missile capabilities. But the story doesn't end there. Li's manipulative tactics extend far beyond a single front company. Sinotech Industry Company and MTTO Industry and Trade Limited are just a couple of the entities he has used to facilitate his illicit operations. These companies, seemingly innocuous on the surface, become conduits for transferring funds, procuring goods, and supporting Iran's missile program. It's a web of intrigue designed to evade scrutiny and maintain Li's position as a key player in the global arms trade. Furthermore, Li's reach extends beyond the borders of China. Sinotech Dalian Carbon and Graphite Manufacturing Corporation, along with Dalian Zhongchuang Cha White Company, have served as vessels for delivering at least 23 separate shipments to Iran. By utilizing front companies such as these, Li ensures a steady supply of sensitive technologies, feeding Iran's insatiable appetite for destructive weaponry. Now let's peel back another layer of Li Fangwei's villainous persona, his financial wizardry. This is where things get really interesting. Li possesses an uncanny ability to manipulate the global financial system, orchestrating deceptive schemes that would make even the most seasoned con artist envious. One of Lee's most notorious feats of financial wizardry involves his skillful use of front companies. These entities, carefully crafted to mask his true intentions, have become the perfect vehicles for his illicit activities. Take, for example, Limt Economic and Trade Company Limited, designated in June 2006 for providing material support to Iran's ballistic missile program. Lee, operating as the commercial manager of Limt, ingeniously directs funds from other companies with which Limt has contracts to his various front companies, such as Sinotech Industry Company and MTTO Industry and Trade Limited. It's a complex web of financial transactions, expertly designed to evade detection and further his nefarious agenda. But that's not all. 
Lee's financial prowess extends to his management of Sinotech Dalian Carbon and Graphite Manufacturing Corporation. And let's not forget, and this is going to be a mouthful, Dalian Zhenghua Maoyi Yuxi and Gongsi, also known as Dalian Zhenghua Trading Company. Lee employs this front company to handle his financial dealings with Iran. In a clever maneuver, Lee enters into a contract with a Chinese manufacturer, arranging for an Aramid fiber production line to be provided to Dalian Zhenghua Trading Company. To transmit the down payment for this transaction, Lee cunningly utilizes a bank account previously associated with Carrot Industry Company Limited, further obscuring his financial trail. Li Fengwei's financial wizardry is nothing short of remarkable. Through a labyrinth of front companies, convoluted transactions and deceptive maneuvers, he has managed to exploit the intricacies of the global financial system to his advantage. It's a chilling display of his ability to outwit authorities and amass the resources needed to fuel his villainous pursuits. Finally, we have the elusive nature of Li Fang Wei, our Bond villain extraordinaire. Just when you think you have him cornered, he slips away like smoke, leaving investigators scratching their heads in frustration. Li's ability to remain one step ahead, to vanish into thin air when the heat is on, is truly remarkable. One prime example of Li's elusive nature is his adeptness at using aliases and false identities. As we mentioned earlier, Carl Li is just one of the masks he wears, seamlessly blending into the shadows. But it doesn't stop there. Li has a knack for creating front companies and manipulating their operations, making it incredibly difficult for authorities to trace his footsteps. Whether it's Success Move Limited, Sinotech Industry Company, or the many others he has set up, Li's web of deception is extensive, rendering him virtually invisible. But it's not just his ability to hide behind false identities that makes Li so elusive. He possesses a remarkable talent for exploiting legal loopholes and leveraging international financial systems to his advantage. Lee has demonstrated a keen understanding of the complexities of global regulations, allowing him to navigate through them with ease. He brazenly engages in international commercial transactions using United States financial institutions, despite being indicted on charges of violating US law. His audacity knows no bounds and it only adds to his air of mystique. Furthermore, Lee has a remarkable talent for staying one step ahead of authorities who are tirelessly pursuing him. Despite being indicted in 2014, he has managed to evade capture for years, always managing to slip away at the last moment. His ability to elude law enforcement agencies and evade arrest is nothing short of astonishing. Li Fangwei's elusive nature is what sets him apart from ordinary criminals. He operates in the shadows, leveraging false identities, exploiting legal grey areas, and consistently outsmarting those who seek to bring him down. It's a game of cat and mouse, with Li always managing to be the one pulling the strings. In conclusion, our captivating account unveils Li Fang Wei as an actual incarnation of a Bond villain, whose audacious acts have reverberated across the realm of global security. With a bounty of up to $5 million on his head, authorities around the globe remain on high alert, eager to bring this elusive mastermind to justice. Now, before we part ways and grab that phone to get that bag, I have something extraordinary to share with you. Cast your gaze to the top of your screen where a captivating tale awaits. Enter the realm of Project Stargate, a clandestine endeavor that entwines the enigmatic CIA and the realm of psychics. Prepare to be enthralled as you delve into a world where psychic abilities were harnessed and explored for clandestine purposes. It's a story that will leave you questioning the boundaries of human potential and the mysteries hidden within the shadows. So my friends, take the next step and click on the next video to uncover the secrets of Project Stargate. The journey awaits and it promises to be a mesmerizing exploration into the unknown. Enjoy!